This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, we've packed a number of shows together to give you some highlights. I know you're going to enjoy the show. Thank you for being with us today. Tell us a little more about your background, how you got in this syndication space. Uh, it seems like everybody are, you know, comes from different walks of life, right, or different industries. And, and so what was that for you? Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Whitney. Um, I'm, you know, a recovering, I guess, CPA to start, you know. Um, so I started my journey, you know, many years ago. Um, you know, I'm a management consultant, CPA, worked in corporate America for a long time. Um, but I always had the real estate bug, if you will. Um, so I actually started buying single family in 2009, 2010 in Toronto, Canada, where I'm from. Um, not knowing much, just knowing that, hey, I just wanted to kind of plant some seeds. And it was more from a long-term investment. Um, made my way down to the States in 2010. And then uh, in 2015, you know, kind of was at a crossroad in, in my life where I had to kind of decide if I was going to continue to climb the corporate rat ladder or, you know, if I wanted to go out and do something on my own. So kind of long story short at that time, real estate had done well for me in Toronto and I wanted to kind of replicate that in the U.S. And, you know, being a finance guy and, and you know, I had single family before, you know, I just knew that multifamily resonated with, with me more. You know, the fact that you could force valuation based on NOI, treat it more like a business. Um, and so, so, you know, kind of started down that path to figure out how I could buy, you know, kind of multifamily. And at the time, it was smaller multifamily, 15 to 20 units in Chicago where I lived. Um, and then long story short, you know, ended up stumbling across, you know, kind of investing in multifamily syndications. Um, in 2015, I started passively investing as an LP. Um, and then once I, you know, kind of did that a number of times, I realized that my skill set and my interests, you know, really peaked and, um, you know, met my now business partner at networking um, event in Texas. And, uh, and yeah, now we, you know, we, we've got a company, Catalyst Equity Partners. We've got, um, you know, we've done close to 2000 units as lead GPs in Houston and Dallas. Um, and, you know, we've got, uh, you know, construction management in house, we've got a small team, we do third party, we use third party for management and really focus on value add. We love heavy renovations. We've done everything from class C to class uh, A multifamily. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I think <laughs> your expertise, uh, you know, coming from a, a CPA background, uh, like everybody needs that on the team. I feel like, uh, as, uh, you know, the the more we've been in the business, uh, it's like, man, uh, you know, having that, uh, we haven't for a long time, you know, have right. it, ha I mean, having somebody internally, we've had third parties that have helped us, you know, right. uh, but man, having somebody internally like yourself that has like a, a CPA, just numbers background, right? You know, I, I'm not an accountant by trade, uh, right. you know, and I don't want to have to tell my quote, you know, accountant what to do. Right. That's yeah. Funny, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. It, it it definitely helps. But as you know, Whitney, it's it's one of those things, right? Like it's a, it's a team sport and, you know, kind of there's different elements yeah. to the skills you need. And I think, you know, in the beginning, you know, I was doing a lot of that accounting review function, but, you know, just like scaling any business, you know, I've kind of, you know, I'm still, you know, kind of maybe the lead on our team, but, you know, we have a fractional CFO that we use, you know, to really dive in because, you know, it's one thing to review books for, you know, two, three deals, you know, but when you've got nine, 10, 11, you know, yeah. things change. And so, uh, but yeah, I think I know enough to be dangerous, um, but, uh, you know, um, yeah. it's been a while. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Well, it's, it's not, and that's another point. It may not be your highest and best use of your time now. Exactly. Either, right. You're, and we're going to talk about some things that you're, you know, you've become an expert in now and, and you all are doing well at, uh, which I want to bring out to the listeners, but, uh, but it's a, uh, uh, that's a good point there to make is like, well, you know, you had this skill set and you still have it, but, but, you know, you've, there, there's another piece that's a better use of your time. Right. right. Uh, and so all right, let's dive into that. I know, you know, before we, before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, your focus on really the asset management communication with investors. And I, I'm just, I'm hearing it all over the place, right? It's not just you, uh, you know, that had brought this up lately, not so much on the show, but I just mean talking to investors or talking right. to other operators man, you know, everybody's trying to figure out how do I communicate better with our investors or LPs are saying, we're not getting any communication from a number right. of, you know, of groups that we've invested with. I'm hearing that way too much. 
Um, but I want to dive into that and how you all do that so well, right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and no. I, you know, I was I, I want to talk about the asset management piece too because I feel like that that plays such a big piece of where the information comes from and starts, and you know, uh, and so let's start with some of that and maybe you know give us some details on your asset management piece or you know operations, right? Uh, and then we'll move to the communication piece to investors and how that all works together. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a great question. I think. You know, it's one of those areas in this business that's often overlooked because it's not the glamorous side, you know, and, you know, you often hear about, you know, deals being acquired and, and everyone gets excited or deals being sold and, and the returns generated. But, you know, every time you acquire a deal, for it, the way I look at it is it's just kind of, you know, pre-work or you're just starting the race, you know, you're just getting to the starting line and, you know, if you just look at it just based on just pure math, right? I mean, on average, a deal is held for 60 months, or at least that's what's projected. It takes three months in the beginning to buy it and three months to sell it. So 90% of the time that you've got this deal is in asset management, you know, but it's probably only 10% of the time talked about, you know? And so anyway, I think it's come to light now, obviously, with the market, you know, being what it is now and changing. And the reality is when we charted in 2015, 2016, there was a lot of tailwinds. And, you know, I think, you know, I wouldn't be alone in saying this, you know, that a lot of people, you know, there was a lot of, you know, sins that were forgiven, if you will, because rent growth was, you know, astronomical or cap rates were compressed. And, you know, the tides definitely change now. And so, you know, we've always, you know, put asset management as kind of the, the lifeline of our business, right? We know that if we cannot, you know, perform on our deals and service our investors, right, then, you know, those investors are not going to come back and we're not going to be able to build our track record, right? And, you know, and I think, you know, having that that view up front and, and with my experience as being an LP and my partner's been an LP prior to us being a GP, you know, we came out and we said, you know, asset management and ensuring that our investors know what's going on, you know, is paramount to our company, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, what we've done and, and you know, uh, from an asset management perspective is we've tried to just build processes where, you know, we've now got an asset manager in-house that's full-time, that 100% oversees our, our, our um, properties. And, you know, before my, my partner Prashant and I were doing that, but you know, I think the reality is that in this business, we're handing over keys to folks that, you know, aren't highly compensated or, you know, don't have a high level of education. And we're expecting them to manage, you know, multi-million dollar assets, right, where we have, you know, significant plans in terms of improving them, adding other income and stuff like that. So there's a lot of sophistication that's come into play and being able to manage that and, you know, influence those folks to be able to get the results that you desire, right? And so it's a lot easier said than done. Um, but we, you know, every deal that we buy, you know, we go to the uh, property management company and say, hey, here's our business plan. They work with it with us. Then we come up with a 90 day and 180 day plan. So it's very clear because most folks, you know, that work in the business at the property level, right? They're just going to do what they've done previously, right? They've been in the business for 15, 20 years, and they're just going to buy a deal and operate it, right? So we set expectations up front, 90-day plan, check in every 30 days on those high-level goals, you know? On a weekly basis, our um, asset manager, we, you know, we've got like a, a dashboard. Uh, we've got different property management companies, so it's not fully integrated, but we've got a set of KPIs that we ask our managers to fill out every week, right? And we're diving into those um, KPIs and you know, trying to look at them as leading indicator, like, hey, if our renewal rate's low, why is that? You know, is it, and asking the questions, why are people moving out, right? Um, if our traffic, you know, is is not high enough to generate the amount of applications we need, what can we do differently, right? So every indicator, you know, there's usually, you know, three or four ideas or whatnot. Um, and then making sure that, you know, our each of our business plans are unique. We've got a couple of deals right now where we're implementing uh, bulk Wi-Fi, right? And that, you know, has some resistance, you know, to the um, residents. Residents have some resist resistance. I was on a call this morning where property manager was like, hey, I got an earful from this resident. They have a contract with their other per service provider and we're putting this on. And we said, no, well, if they have a contract and they could, you know, prove it, we'll just say they don't have to get on board on our, you know, um, internet until the contract's done, Right. So it's being close enough to the ground, you know, um, and so we've just built these processes where we've got, we've got weekly calls with the property management company, 
then monthly review calls with the regional manager. And that helps me and my partner, you know, help articulate the commentary to our investors, right? Our asset manager is talking to our construction team, right? So our construction manager joins the asset management calls, you know, on a weekly, on a sorry, monthly basis, just so they can know how many units we're doing. So everything, everyone's talking to each other. Because what we've noticed is that when you stop the communication, a lot of things break down, right? And then from there, what we do is we have our, our monthly P&L reviews, right? And then we do distributions on a quarterly basis. So then on a quarterly basis, we work with our fractional CFO to really dive deep into our financials, understand our cash position, see what's coming ahead. I think a lot of times, you know, you know, a lot of people are looking at what's happened and, you know, we've got some cash now, so let's distribute, but we know, hey, we've got, for example, older assets and, you know, we may need, you know, X amount more in capital to, to, to you know, improve these deals or whatnot, right? So we have to hold that back. So anyway, it's, you know, I'm trying to go from, you know, where we are on a day-to-day -day basis and we kind of bring it up top and then we're able to articulate the results financially um, and, you know, CapEx wise and ultimately distributions to our investors. You know, I know I, I've said a lot there, but, you know, we try to, you know, work from the, you know, the, give them the big picture, make sure they're executing day by day by these different KPIs that we track and then able to explain the story to, you know, someone as an investor so they can understand. Yeah, no, that's uh, some, a lot of great detail there. I want to dive in a little bit on, because uh, it, it's it is a process, and, and the more we we want to communicate well, we want to communicate often. Uh, but there, it's taxing to the team, right? You know, as we've gotten many many you know deals as well, and we're trying to update updates on all these deals. We're right there with you. You know, it's like pretty soon. Like this is a lot of work for a few people every month, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's it is a lot of work, and and uh, uh, and and I think oftentimes LPs don't maybe realize how much how much work does go into making those updates happen, uh, but it still has to happen. Yep. <laughs> it still has yep. to happen. Yep. So, yep. but the but the the more we can streamline that process, the better, right? right. And, and obviously, in the more accuracy and all those things. Um, and, and the more we're communicating, and I liked what you said there. I wrote it down. You know, when you stop communicating, things break down, right? right. Uh, or, or there is something broken, right? If you're, you know, that's why you're not communicating, maybe. But you know, speak to the information that's expected to come from your property management company that helps you to maybe streamline some of the communication with investors. We're going to get to the communication, you know, in a minute with investors. But uh, you know, I say as the asset manager or the operator. You know, talk about what's expected exactly, you know, what kind of reports on a monthly basis. How is that helping you all to generate the best information, you know, for investors? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the the good thing about this business is that there are great systems that these property management companies have to get, you know, all the data that you need. You know, um, I think, you know, from a summary level, you know, we obviously have our PL or balance sheet, cash flow and whatnot, but you know, those are what I kind of, you know, you know, basically financial statements, right? But really what I look at on a week to week basis are more of the leading indicators, which are occupancy, our leasing, our trends, what's our box score, you know, how many, how many units are, you know, vacant, not rented for how long, you know, and so our traffic, where are the sources of our traffic, um, our renewal rates, I think are very telling. And a key metrics that we track across every single portfolio, you know, and, you know, we've done this for long enough that we can figure out like, okay, this trend is really low. And is it a seasonality thing? Or do we just not have good leasing? Um, and then we've got a few things that we've developed that are like, okay, if this is happening, there's like three or four things, at least we've seen that most likely are, or at least 80% of the time are the root costs, you know? Um, and so, so yeah, so all that information helps us um, on a weekly basis make changes, right? Because, you know, the reality is that the financial reports you get, you know, 15 or 20 days after the end of the month, and it's way too late to affect change, right? Yeah. And so we're trying to make changes, you know, I mean, quite frankly, now it's daily, you know, but at least on a weekly basis. And then, you know, by the time I'm reviewing the reports that my asset manager and fractional CFO put together, you know, I've already got the story because I know from a weekly basis, I've seen the trends, you know, and so there may be something that happened in those two weeks that, you know, that I may have to update investors on, 
But by then we kind of already know, like, you know, August 1st, I already know how July financials are going to look. I don't know the exact numbers, but I know the general story, you know? And so, um, so yeah, that's, that's really, you know, what we look at. And there's, you know, to answer your question specifically, I mean, each property manager software, they have specific reports that they send us on a weekly basis. And then my asset manager has created the catalyst KPI tracker, which he puts in because we've got different properties and different systems, puts it in. So then we've got our list of 15 or 20 KPIs that we review weekly. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Uh, I just want the listeners and myself to hear the things that are important to you. And I love that hey, you're, you're, you have a specific list of leading indicators that you're watching on a weekly basis. Uh, I think that says a lot as well. Somebody on the team needs to be doing that. Right? Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's so important uh, and and keeping a pulse like that and, you know, even weekly and sometimes even more often, uh, you know, maybe depending on the asset and, and what's happening there, right? Um, you know, speak to them and we'll start this. And just so listeners know, we're going to do another segment with Shane. We're going to dive in a little further into the communication with investors as well. Uh, but but maybe, uh, you know, how how many people are involved in the process, I guess, of converting, say, you know, this information to, you know, your investor updates? Yeah, I think it's it's really it's really two, you know, or, okay. or three when you consider me. It's our asset manager that you know, is compiling all the data. Um, obviously he's working day to day, you know, in it. So he's, you know, aggregating it, you know, and, and the thing is going back to your earlier point, you know, we've systematized this so that any report coming from Catalyst has the same structure, right? We've got sponsor yeah. commentary, p &L, et cetera, but then the deal story changes per deal, right? Um, and then we've got our CFO that helps us re review to make sure that, you know, because as you know, Whitney, these are capital intensive businesses, right? And I think, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, there's a lot of ins and outs, you know, and, and we're talking about thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars that are going, you know, when you're getting a draw and you're you're waiting for a draw, you need to submit a draw and, and whatnot. So we're just making sure that, you know, we're understanding the cash inflows and outflows. And so once the asset manager and the CFO work together to make sure, okay, do we have that story? Then, you know, I come in and my partner come in to review just to make sure like, you know, like there's, a, you know, some deals we have rate caps or, or you know, the, um, and, and floating rate debt, right? So how to articulate that to investors, right? What is the, you know, bigger picture, you know, um, end goal of this deal? Are we going to planning on refinancing in six months? You know, are we going to try to sell, you know, what are the trends? So that's where we come in to kind of tip and top. But I would say between the asset manager and fractional CFO, 90% of it's done. And then we come in to tip and top and make sure we send it out. Love that. And one quick thing, and this, uh, uh, and we're in the middle of this as well, but you're a fractional CFO. Uh, and so they're not, you know, just so the listener knows, uh, you know, you can, you can, you can hire somebody fractionally, you know, in that role, right? Yeah. Uh, speak to how you found this person and maybe, you know, how, uh, you know, how you, implemented a skill set like that that's maybe not an employee right yeah yeah you know i think it was you know uh as we alluded to i mean asset management and doing the financial reporting i mean just based on what i just said it's a lot of work uh, and yeah. to be quite honest with you it's a full-time job right so we got to the point where we were doing this role what i just described between me and my partner for the first three or four deals right and we're it helped us tremendously because we were close to the details and whatnot, but it was hard for us to grow because once you can't do it after you do, you know, five, six more deals. And so, you know, we, you know, hired our asset manager. And then, you know, from my perspective as an, an LP and other deals, you know, quite frankly, it just, you know, the property management company, their job is to manage the property and they do property accounting and, you know, not to put up any shade on property management companies, but they're just getting the books done and sending them out to you, right? They don't have the foresight to say, hey, is this deal in a bad cash position or not? They'll come to you when there's no cash to pay payroll, but they're not thinking about, hey, three months ahead, right? And so, you know, I was in a couple of deals where I just, you know, I would look at the balance sheet and I would say, well, we got no working capital, we got no cash, but we're paying out distributions, you know? And and, and and anyway, so so using those experiences, we never wanted to be in that position. And we just said, okay, let's go try to find someone that can understands our business. So found somebody actually online on LinkedIn, you know, has was doing this on a smaller scale. And, you know, we kind of developed a relationship. He actually worked at a, a previous employer of mine. So we kind of shared some common ground. And um, I think at the time we were probably one of the the biggest, you know, multifamily clients of theirs. And uh and we just kind of just said, hey, let's do a contract little basis and kind of did, I don't know, 10, 15 hours a month. And then we've scaled that up as we've grown. Um, and it's been great. You know, uh, we collaborate 
um, in a lot of ways. And he's yeah. uh, an aid, you know. And I, I want to get all the way to to the investor update, you know, itself, right. right? And so now you've gathered this information. They've looked at this together. You know, let's just keep going from there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think, you know, obviously, you know, in the syndication business, we don't have a business without our investors, right? right. And I think, um, you know, that's something that is near and dear to us as a company. Um, people have worked very hard for their money and, you know, they're they're trusting you as an operator and you're a steward of their capital, right? And I think, you know, at, based on some of my experience as an LP, you know, there was, you know, a lot of communication up front when we were hey, trying to buy the deal and then I invested passively. And then, there was just no rhythm or cadence, you know, it was just, you know, they would give updates, you know, kind of, you know, just randomly and, you know, and, and honestly, some of the deals performed well, but I don't think those operators, you know, would have performed as well in today's market, you know, and so, you know, we, we kind of have this saying that, you know, kind of no news is, is generally considered like bad news, you know, and so we would rather over communicate to our investors um and you know um and just sh show that respect right so a couple things before we get into reports you know it's a huge pet peeve of mine if somebody reaches out to our team you know we've got a separate you know current investors inbox and i told my team within 24 hours your business hours they need a response you know these folks have invested 50 75 100k plus they need a response we may not know the answer but we need to respond to them say hey we're looking into it you know so that's kind of like one of the rules at our company if you will um, and, you know, I just, I just take that to, you know, customer service, right. Um, you know, I think as an LP, it's one thing that if people are not responsive from the beginning, that's generally not a good sign. Um, so, you know, what we've developed, you know, and, and it's nothing that's rocket science, but I think our whole philosophy is that we want to treat our company, even though we're a smaller boutique, like a larger institutional private equity firm, right? So that, you know, if we were going to start doing deals with family offices, and private equity, we have the systems reporting processes down pat, right? And I think that comes with, um, you know, a starting point for us is taking all this data that we do on a month to month basis. And sure, there's probably one or 2% of the investor base that wants all that data. But more often than not, most of these folks, you know, want the summary view, right? How it impacts them and their investment. And so we take all that data and on a monthly basis, without fail, you're going to hear about your deal and from Catalyst Equity with the standard monthly report, you know, um, in the first year when we buy a property and generally what we buy, Whitney, is value add deals that, you know, between the first 18 months or so is really when we're doing the heavy lift. Um, we always do a six six month webinar, right? Because one thing to send out a you know a monthly report, it's in PDF. You got all the addendums and financials attached. But at six month mark, we say, hey, you know, you guys invested six months ago. We do a webinar, which is you know thirty to an hour long. You know, we go dive deep into our quarterly results, and then we give an opportunity. We a talk about what's coming next, what our challenges, our risks. Um, and then we give an opportunity for folks to ask questions. They could ask questions throughout the whole time anyway, but it gives them an opportunity to hear from us, you know? Um, and then on a yearly basis, we do an annual webinar, right? And that's a reflection of basically like, how do we do, you know, kind of grade us from, we intended to do this, our projections, this is what happened. And then we kind of give a go forward of this next year, right? And I think, you know, we always talk about the risks. We always talk about the challenges. We talk about the wins as well. Um, and then go forward from there, we'll monthly uh, reports happen every month without fail. And then we do annual webinars. Um, so that's kind of our standard. And then if there's anything that happens, you know, in the interim, you know, COVID was a good example, right? Instead of having monthly reports, quite frankly, for like, I think two, three months, we were giving weekly reports, just let investors know quick emails. Hey, this is what's happened. This was our occupancy. We, you know, we can't evict, et cetera. So we did that. And then we scaled that back when things kind of came back to normal. You know, if we've got a challenging deal for whatever be the, the reason, right, we'll do a, a webinar, even if it's halfway year two, right? It wasn't scheduled, but hey, you know, we're going to do a webinar. If we're going to go sell or refinance a deal, you know, we'll do a webinar to say, hey, this is why, you know, we did an analysis. This is why we think we should refinance. Etc. So we've got our standard process, and then there are these ad hoc, you know, kind of uh, um, items that happen that we, you know, address those. But I think given that cadence um, and the fact that you know our 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 folks on our team respond to investors within 24 hours, 
you know, um, you know, we 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 just want to give that good customer experience because you know we're not perfect. Our, not all of our deals are perfect. There's always in challenges. These are investments. For sure. We want the investors to know that we're doing everything we can, and and that that's that's basically our process. Yeah, you know, I guess help us to kind of see your update. You know, right, audibly. Uh, you know, like if I was looking at your update, uh, you know, I guess what's kind of a layout that that you all present to investors, and and what are some crucial things that you know you're definitely including on a monthly basis. You know, yeah. I mean, whether it's market data or whether it's deal specifics, occupancy to whatever, you know, details there to distributions to, you know, what, give us some, yeah, I guess, yeah, paint, yeah, yeah. paint a picture for us. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. I mean, it's, it's really, it starts with, we've got a report that has, you know, and this is the flow, right. It starts with sponsor commentary, right. And basically that's, Hey, we just ended the month of June. You know, our occupancy was X, Y, and Z compare that to last month or last quarter, whatever's relevant. Our collections were X, Y, and Z. Uh, you know, above or below budget for whatever reasons, you know, talk about any, you know, uniqueness in the expenses. Like sometimes, you know, in Texas, taxes will come out and you'll have to accrue or you had a insurance renewal. So those are like one time events. So we kind of give the sponsor commentary that helps them understand that month. Right. And then we've got, you know, basically a PL summary. And essentially that PL summary at a high level says, you know, what are, you know, on a yearly basis, a T3 basis, which means last three months, and a T1 basis, right? Where are actuals re relative to budget and the variance for that? So then we know we could say, hey, you know, T12 is here, but we're trending upwards or whatever the story is. We've got charts that follow to show kind of the, you know, key trends and expenses. And then we've got a CapEx update, you know, which after we've completed the plan, that becomes uh, a little bit more light. But in the first one to two years, it's, Hey, we knocked out phase one of our of our uh, capex plan, which was most of the exteriors. We're now doing you know ten units a month on the exteriors. They're getting this lease trade out. You know these are some of the challenges we're having with materials and sourcing. So, and then we include pictures of this is the before unit, this is our after, this is our old signage, this is our new signage. So we include pictures, and then at the end we kind of close out with a admin slash distribution, right? So if it's admin, it's Hey, you know, we've got a webinar coming up, you know, your invite will follow or, hey, taxes um, are going to be available in the portal March 15th. You know, if it's a distribution month, we talk about, hey, you know, this is our this, this is our results. This is what we're going to distribute. These are what we're keeping in reserves. This is when you're going to get it. So that's the general premise of our report. And then we've got attached to that, you know, we've got the P&L balance sheet, you know, a rent roll. And then in our portal, our investors can go and, you know, download the 200 different reports that, you know, our property manager shares with that if they will, if they want to, I should say. Can I ask what uh, portal, you know, investor portal you all use? Yeah, we're we're on uh, IMS. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, like RealPage. Yeah, yeah Real, Real Page. Uh, yeah, 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 now I'm familiar. Uh, quite familiar with them, uh, but uh, so you all, you all ultimately will upload those reports from property management to the portal uh, and then investors can log in and, and see those reports. Yeah, yeah. I would say less than 2% actually will review that. Yeah. I think with our, our PDF, that's ours and those three main statements, balance sheet, uh, P and L and rent roll, you know, most investors are, you know, that, that satisfies them, you know? Yeah. Every once in a while, I get an investor that I call me at like eight in the morning. He's like, Whitney, I was looking at, at page 13, line 42 <laughs> yeah. last night at, at midnight. And I, you know, right, but that's right. very rare, right? right. However, rare. I do love that I, I do that that information is available, right? Yeah. Or just putting it out there, just the transparency, you know, of that as well, that you all are, are putting it in a portal. Or if you want to see it, it's there. We're happy to walk right. you through it, you know, right? Or answer questions. And and uh, uh, but at least it's you know it is available right so they can see it you know th this report too I I, uh, I you know even internally at LifeBridge you know it's it's like uh, it's morphed into a number of things right you know over a lot of time and as we try to improve this process you know are there any ways that you found to maybe streamline this you know in a way that maybe you didn't know two years ago right you know or or any thoughts behind 
uh, you know, hey, you know, when we re- when we started doing it this way or this process from these reports or I, I don't know, just any thoughts? Yeah, on yeah. That? So I, I think I think that's a great question and one that honestly we grappled with for a couple of years, you know, because you know you get you get a report from one property manager company, it looks a little different. Then you're trying to analyze it. This deal story is different, and I think the game changer happened for us when we have our asset manager and fractional CFO, and we built a template. Right. We literally built a template that we take all this data, right? And we push it into our template that we use to analyze our cash and all this stuff. And then that standard template, we've got, you know, basically our report tabs, you know, and we're pulling the same data that we've already mapped into our template. And then we're pulling that data. And so our asset manager is not thinking like, oh, for this deal, I got to go do this. And for this deal, I got that this property manager software doesn't have this data. We've already figured that all out, right? And so when we come to generating reports, it's really the numbers are already there. It's really the story that we just have to do every month, you know? And I think that's been a, a huge game changer. And a couple other things that we that we have in our report now that I think about it is, you know, we, we've got, hey, you know, because a lot of times investors are in 20 deals, right? They don't know that, hey, we bought this deal at this time, you know, this is the equity, you know, this was the, this is the value right now. This is our interest rate. Um, Another thing that we do, Whitney, is we create, you know, and this may begin to too much detail, but a lot of investors want, need to update their schedule of real estate owned, right? SREO. And in the beginning, I used to get random emails, like, you know, somebody's buying a deal or whatever. And they're like, hey, I need, you know, these 20 things filled out, right? And then, and, you know, in the beginning, like, okay, we'll do it. And then starting like four years ago, we just said every deal, we've got a template. It's going to answer every question you need. It's on the portal for your deal, download it, and you can fill it out, you know? And so that kind of alleviated some stress from our, our back office team. Okay. So that's helpful. I mean, that's, that's a way that you're adding value to your investors, right? And, and you're relieving that burden for your team, right? And I just, I love that because it provides an immediate response to your investors too that need that. Right, here's yep. the information. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, they're, I'm, I'm traveling, or my, my business partner. Right. When we didn't have a team I'm traveling, I'm, you know, tra- you know, and I'm like, you know what? And this was a total game changer. And we communicate that up front. We buy a deal. Hey, these are our admin steps. You know, welcome. Frequently asked questions. We've got this guide, and this is here. And so, I mean, it's reduced. I mean, honestly, I probably get. I used to get, you know, just call it. I don't know, five requests a month, and I probably get five requests a year now. You know. Yeah. And those folks just didn't remember that it was there. So. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.